Hello and welcome back to A-Level Biology Help. Today I'm going to take you through the receptors chapter for AQA A-Level Biology. Also, I'll be going through a couple of exam questions and explain their mark schemes. And as always, I'll be putting timestamps in the comments section to each section of the video so that you can skip to them if you do not wish to watch the whole video. Right, so let's get started. So this is the basic structure of the video today. So we are going to cover receptors. So what are receptors and what do they do? Then we are going to cover two types of receptors. So the Persinian corpuscle and then the two types of photoreceptors. So a receptor for light in the human retina. So let's begin. So what are receptors? Receptors are chemical structures, mostly proteins, that respond to sp specific stimuli such as pressure, pH, light, etc. Stimulation of a receptor leads to the establishment of a generator potential, which can cause a response. Now, a potential is basically an electrical difference between two sides of a membrane in the nervous system. But don't worry if you are a bit confused about what generator potentials are, as these will be covered in much more detail when I do my video about nerve impulses. So here is an example of a receptor. So it is a protein complex within a cell membrane. So now I'm going to get on to a particular type of receptor, which is called a persinian corpuscle. So as you can see, the persinian corpuscle has lots of layers of connective tissue. I'll just get my pen. So you kind of need to be familiar with the growth structure of a persinian corpuscle. So as you can see, it has layers of connective tissue with viscous gel between. Surrounded by a capsule and the layers of connective tissue surround the a sensory neuron. So this bit here is a sensory neuron with the nerve ending in the middle here. And also it has a blood supply via a blood capillary. Persinian corpuscles are most often situated deep in the skin in fingers and feet. So here is a structure of a cell membrane within a persinian corpuscle. So here we have the space in the persinian corpuscle the membrane and then the sensory neuron that is surrounded by the persinian corpuscle. Now within these membranes we have what we call stretch mediated sodium ion channels. So stretch mediated sodium ion or Na plus channels. So at resting state which is when the nerve isn't stimulated so there is no stimulus the channel proteins are too narrow for Na plus 2 diffuse through to the sensory neuron, so a resting potential is maintained. Resting potential is the electrical difference between both sides of the membrane when the neuron is at rest, so the sensory neuron is at rest, so there's no stimulus. So here we have three sodium ions. And as you can see by the diagram, it is too narrow for them to cross. Rest potential is maintained through the diffusion of potassium ions or transport of potassium ions into the sensory neuron as the channels are much more permeable to potassium ions. So the resting potential is actually negative so it's, it is around minus 70 millivolts. Don't worry we will cover this more when we talk about nerve impulses in the next video. But you're probably wondering well if potassium ions have a positive charge, then why is the rest potential a negative charge? The reason for that is, well, when the potassium ions are transported into the sensory neuron to maintain resting potential, this creates a concentration gradient. So this means that the potassium ions can be transported into the persinian corpuscle again, so maintaining that negative resting potential. Now I have written three sodium ions here for a reason. This is because the three sodium ions are pumped out into the persinian corpuscle, but they are not allowed back in as it is impermeable as 
resting state is confirmed here. So the resting potential is the difference in electrical charge inside and outside the neuron when the neuron is at rest or not conducting the impulse. So to summarise, this sodium ion channel here, or sometimes we call it the sodium potassium pump, transports three sodium ions out into the Pacinian corpuscle and two potassium ions into the sensory neuron to maintain resting potential. So this means that no unnecessary impulses are sent, which would cause havoc in the brain. However, when we have a pressure from the stimulus, such as heat or pressure, for example, in this case pressure, this causes the stretch-mediated sodium ion channel to bend and stretch, so that sodium ions can now be transported through to the sensory neuron. This establishes what we call a generator potential. Right, so now we are going to talk about the human retina. So the human retina is a part of the eye that detects light from images. So the human retina contains two types of photoreceptor. Now we use the term photoreceptor here instead of just receptor, as the human retina is mainly focusing on light. So photo light. So the two types of photoreceptor that you may have heard of before are called rods and cones. So here we have an image of a rod, so as the name suggests, it is like a rod shape. And the cone here is kind of more like a cone shape, so as the name suggests, cone. So here we have a diagram of how the rods and cones are connected to the nervous system within the eye. So when the rods and cones detect a stimulus, electrical signals are first transferred to bipolar cells, which is this layer here. I'll just draw an arrow. Then the electrical impulse or the action potential or generator potential is transferred to ganglion cells. And then the impulse is transferred to optic nerve axon axons. The active ne optic nerve then carries the impulse to the brain where it is relayed back to the eye, so an image is produced. So first we're going to talk about the properties of rods. The interesting thing about rods is that they can't distinguish between different wavelengths of light. This means that images are processed in black and white. This is because different wavelengths of light reflect different colours. So as the rods can't distinguish between these different wavelengths, you can't detect different colours, so the images are therefore processed in black and white. Next, rods can't detect very, very low light intensities. I mean, sorry, they can detect very low light intensities. This is because many rod cells are connected to a single sensory neuron. So if I just draw up here, like, a few circles to represent the rods. So many rods, I've just done four here, are connected to a single sensory neuron. In this case, this is the optic nerve. This is called high spatial summation. Also, the action potential threshold, so the voltage required to be able to carry a sufficient nerve impulse to the brain, is low as many rod cells are connected to a single bipolar cell. So as we mentioned in the, a few, couple of minutes ago, the bipolar cells are what are connected to the photoreceptors, so the rods and cones. This is what we call summation. In rods, rhodopsin is the main pigment used. So this pigment has to be broken down in order for a action potential or an, or an electrical impulse is transferred to the bipolar cells and the ganglion cells, then the optic nerve. Also, we need to note that ROS have what we call a low visual acuity. A low visual acuity means that ROS can't distinguish between two separate sources of light. So if we have two circles, if it's shown an image of two circles, then the ROS can't detect them, so they might look like they are just one circle. So now we're going to get on to cones. So as it says here, 
there are three subtypes of cones. And these three types have different types of iodopsin pigment. So don't get confused between rhodopsin and iodopsin. The easiest way to remember this is that, well, rhodopsin starts with an R and rod starts with an R. So that's easier to remember. So cones contain iodopsin and they contain three different types of iodopsin pig pigments, which are red, blue and green. So this means that cones can absorb different wavelengths of light as they have different types of pigments here, so they can detect different colours. So they are not just black and white, like in rods. However, cones can only respond to high light intensity, as only one con cone cell connects to a bipolar cell, so there is no spatial summation, as there is in the rods. So if I just draw up here, so we just have a circle to represent the cone, so just one cone connects to one sensory neuron. This also means that the action potential threshold is very high. This means that cones can detect or distinguish between separate sources of detected light. So if you had an image of two circles, then you would be able to detect them as two circles, for example. So we can say that cones have a high visual acuity instead of a low visual acuity like we have in rods. So here we have an image of an eye and here we have the retina. So you need to know how the rods and cones are distributed in the eye or the retina. Cones are situated near the fovea as this is where light is focused on when it passes through the lens and as cones as we have seen here respond to high only respond to high light intensity then the fovea is when the highest concentration of light is focused so most cones are focused here however rods are distributed more evenly throughout the eye Right, that is it for the content, and now I'm going to get on to a couple of exam style questions. Now, there aren't a lot of exam style questions for the receptor section, as the exam questions for this topic cross over a lot with the nervous impulse section. Right, so if I just get my highlighter out. So, a biologist investigated the stimulation of a Persinian corpuscle in the skin of a fingertip. She used microelectrodes to measure the maximum membrane potential, membrane potential being the electrical difference between the different sides of the membrane, of a Persinian corpuscle and its sensory neuron when different pressures were applied to the fingertip. So the different pressures here is the independent variable. So the figure below shows the Persinian corpuscle, its sensory neuron and the position of the microelectrodes. So here we have our persinian corpuscle here and the sensory neuron with the microelectrode P and microelectrode Q. So we have two different microelectrodes here. So the table below shows some of the biologist's results. So here we have the column that says pressure applied to the fingertip. So we have no pressure, light, medium and heavy pressure. We have the membrane potential at microelectrode P in millivolts and the membrane potential at Q in millivolts again. So let's look at the question. So the question says, explain how the resting potential of minus 70 millivolts is maintained in the sensory neuron when no pressure is applied. So as this is an explained question, you need to explain why something occurs, not just what occurs. So what this question is asking you to do is to explain how resting potential is maintained. So as we said earlier on in the video, resting potential is made through the sodium-potassium pump. So you just need to recall what I said about that. So this is what I've written, so it is clear for the examiner. The membrane is less permeable to sodium ions, but more permeable to potassium ions. This means that sodium ions are pumped out, whilst potassium ions are pumped in. So as I said earlier, the sodium ions are pumped out. So three are pumped out, but two potassium ions are pumped in, which creates a concentration gradient of potassium ions, so they move can move back out. So the negative resting potential is maintained. 
and the membrane is less permeable to sodium ions as the stretch mediated sodium ion channels are too narrow for them to pass through. But you don't need to go into that much detail as this is only a two mark question. So let's look at the mark scheme. So mark point one says membrane is more permeable to potassium ions and less permeable to sodium ions. So we put that. And the second marking point says sodium ions are actively transported or pumped out and potassium ions are pumped in. So we put that. So we would get both marks for this question. So let's move on to the next question. The next question says explain how applying pressure to the Pacinian corpuscle produces the changes in membrane potential recorded by microelectrode P. Now, as this question asks about microelectrode P, we need to look at this middle column here. So as you can see, as the pressure increases from non to heavy, the membrane potential becomes more positive. This is because, as I said earlier on in the video, when pressure is applied to the Pacinian corpuscle, the stretch mediated sodium ion channels become wider and stretch more so that the sodium ions can be pumped in. As sodium ions are positively charged, this increases the membrane potential. So this is what I've written. Pressure causes the membrane to become stretched. So sodium ion channels or stretch mediated sodium ion channels in the membrane open and sodium ions move in. But also I've written that more channels open when the pressure is greater. Because as you can see, the jump between light and medium is higher than the jump between non and light as we only have a 20 millivolt difference between non and light but we have an 80 millivolt um, difference between light and medium so this is because more channels are opening as the pressure increases so let's look at the mark scheme so the first marking point says pressure causes but you don't need to write pressure causes as this is in brackets so pressure causes the membrane, or you can put lamellae, to become deformed or stretched. So we put that. So the second marking point says that sodium ion channels in the membrane open and sodium ions move in. We also put that, so we would get that mark. And the final marking point says greater pressure means more channels open, so or you can put more sodium ions enter. But we put more channels open. So we would get that mark. So we would get all three marks for this question. Right, that is all I want to say for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please, please comment below if you have any questions at all. I'll be more than happy to answer them and I'll see you in the next video.